Chapter 7 of The Mastery of Destiny. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. The Mastery of Destiny by James Allen. Chapter 7 Cultivation of Concentration. Concentration, or the bringing of the mind to a center and keeping it there, is vitally necessary to the accomplishment of any task. It is the father of thoroughness and the mother of excellence. As a faculty, it is not an end in itself, but is an aid to all faculties, all work. Not a purpose in itself, it is yet a power which serves all purposes. Like steam in mechanics, it is a dynamic force in the machinery of the mind and the functions of life. The faculty is a common possession, though in its perfection it is rare. Just as will and reason are common possessions, though a perfectly poised will and a comprehensive reason are rare possessions, the mystery which some modern mystical writers have thrown around it is entirely superlifious. Every successful man, in whatever direction his success may lie, practices concentration, though he may know nothing about it as a subject of study. Every time one becomes absorbed in a book or task, or is wrapped in devotion or assiduous in duty, concentration, in a greater or lesser degree, is brought into play. Many books purporting to give instructions on concentration make its practice and acquisition an end in itself. Then this, there is no surer nor swifter way to its destruction. The fixing of the eye upon the tip of the nose, upon a doorknob, a picture, a mystical symbol, or the portrait of a saint, or the centering of the mind upon the navel, the pineal gland, or some imaginary point in space. I have seen all these methods seriously advised in works on this subject, with the object of acquiring concentration. It is like trying to nourish the body by merely moving the jaws in the act of eating, without taking food. Such methods prevent the end at which they aim. They lead towards dispersion and not concentration, towards weakness and imbecility rather than towards power and intelligence. I have met those who have squandered, by these practices, what measure of concentration they at first possessed, and have become the prey of a weak and wandering mind. Concentration is an aid to the doing of something. It is not the doing of something in itself. A ladder has no divine knowledge or the sweeping of a floor, without resorting to methods which have no practical bearing in life. For what is concentration but the bringing of a well-controlled mind to the doing of that which has to be done? He who does his work in an aimless or hurried or thoughtless manner, and resorts to his artificial concentration methods, to his doorknob, his picture, or nasal extremity, in order to gain that which he imagines to be some kind of mystical power, but which is a very ordinary and practical quality, though he may drift towards insanity, and I knew one man who became insane by these practices, he will not increase in steadiness of mind. The great enemy of concentration, and therefore of all skill and power, is a wavering, wandering, undisciplined value in and of itself but only in so far as it enables us to reach something which we could not otherwise reach. In like manner, concentration is that which enables the mind to accomplish with ease that which it would be otherwise impossible to accomplish. But of itself, it is a dead thing, and not a living accomplishment. Concentration is so interwoven with the uses of life that it cannot be separated from duty, and he who tries to acquire it apart from his task, his duty, will not only fail, but will diminish, and not increase, his mental control and executive capacity, and so render himself less and less fit to succeed in his undertakings. A scattered and undisciplined army would be useless. To make it effective in action and swift in victory, it must be solidly concentrated and masterfully directed. Scattered and diffused thoughts are weak and worthless. Thoughts marshaled, commanded, and directed upon at a given point are invincible, 
confusion, doubt, and difficulty give way before their masterly approach. Concentrated thought enters largely into all successes and informs all victories. There is no more secret about its acquirement than about any other acquisition, for it is governed by the underlying principle of all development, namely, practice. To be able to do a thing, you must begin to do it, and keep on doing it until the thing is mastered. This principle prevails universally in all arts, sciences, trades, in all learning, conduct, religion. To be able to paint, one must paint. To know how to use a tool skillfully, he must use the tool. To become learned, he must learn. To become wise, he must do wise things. And to successfully concentrate his mind, he must concentrate it. But the doing is not all. It must be done with energy and intelligence. The beginning of concentration, then, is to go to your daily task and put your mind on it, bringing all your intelligence and mental energy to a focus upon that which has to be done. And every time the thoughts are found wandering aimlessly away, they should be brought promptly back to the thing in hand. Thus the center upon which you are to bring your mind to a point is not your pineal gland or a point in space, but the work which you are doing every day, and your object in thus concentrating is to be able to do your work with smooth rapidity and consummate skill. For until you can thus do your work, you have not gained any degree of control over the mind, you have not acquired the power of concentration. This powerful focusing of one's thought and energy and will upon the doing of things is difficult at first, as everything worth acquiring is difficult, but daily efforts, strenuously made and patiently followed up, will soon lead to such a measure of self-control as will enable one to bring a strong and penetrating mind to bear upon any work undertaken, a mind that will quickly comprehend all the details of the work, and dispose of them with accuracy and dispatch. He will thus, as his concentrative capacity increases, enlarge his usefulness in the scheme of things, and increase his value to the world, thus inviting nobler opportunities, and opening the door to higher duties. He will also experience the joy of a wider and fuller life. In the process of concentration, there are the four following stages. 1. Attention. 2. Contemplation. 3. Abstraction. 4. Activity in repose. At first the thoughts are arrested, and the mind is fixed upon the object of concentration, which is the task in hand. This is attention. The mind is then roused into vigorous thought concerning the way of proceeding with the task. This is contemplation. Protracted contemplation leads to a condition of mind in which the doors of the senses are all closed against the entrance of outside distractions, the thoughts being wrapped in, and solely and intensely centered upon the work in hand. This is abstraction. The mind thus centered in profound cogitation reaches a state in which the maximum of work is accomplished with the minimum of friction. This is activity in repose. Attention is the first stage in all successful work. Those who lack it fail in everything. Such are the lazy, the thoughtless, the indifferent, and incompetent. When attention is followed by an awakening of the mind to serious thought, then the second stage is reached. To ensure success in all ordinary, worldly undertakings, it is not necessary to go beyond these two stages. They are reached, in a greater or lesser degree, by all that large army of skilled and competent workers which carries out the work of the world in its manifold departments, and only a comparatively small number reach the third stage of abstraction, for when abstraction is reached, we have entered the sphere of genius. In the first two stages, the work and the mind are separate, and the work is done more or less laboriously, and with a degree of friction, but in the third stage, a marriage of the work with the mind takes place, there is a fusion, a union, and the two become one, 
then there is a superior efficiency with less labor and friction in the perfection of the first two stages the mind is objectively engaged and is easily drawn from its center by external sights and sounds but when the mind has attained perfection in abstraction the subjective method of working is accomplished as distinguished from the objective the thinker is then oblivious to the outside world but is vividly alive in his mental operations if spoken to he will not hear and if plied with more vigorous appeals he will bring back his mind to outside things as one coming out of a dream indeed this abstraction is a kind of waking dream but its similarity to a dream ends with the subjective state it does not obtain in the mental operations of that state in which instead of the confusion of dreaming there is perfect order penetrating insight and a wide range of comprehension whoever attains to perfection in abstraction will manifest genius in the particular work upon which his mind is centered inventors artists poets scientists philosophers and all men of genius are men of abstraction they accomplish subjectively and with ease that which the objective workers men who have not yet attained beyond the second stage in concentration cannot accomplish with the most strenuous labor when the fourth stage that of activity and repose is attained then concentration in its perfection is acquired i am unable to find a single word which will fully express this dual condition of intense activity combined with steadiness or rest and have therefore employed the term activity and repose the term appears contradictory but the simple illustration of a spinning top will serve to explain the paradox when a top spins at the maximum velocity the friction is reduced to the minimum and the top assumes that condition of perfect repose which is a sight so beautiful to the eye and so captivating to the mind of the schoolboy who then says his top is asleep the top is apparently motionless but it is at rest not of inertia but of intense and perfectly balanced activity so the mind that has acquired perfect concentration is when engaged in that intense activity of thought which results in productive work of the highest kind in a state of quiet poise and calm repose externally there is no apparent activity no disturbance and the face of a man who has acquired this power will assume a more or less radiant calmness and the face will be more sublimely calm when the mind is most intensely engaged in active thought each stage of concentration has its particular power thus the first stage when perfected leads to usefulness the second leads to skill ability talent the third leads to originality and genius while the fourth leads to mastery and power and makes leaders and teachers of men in the development of concentration also as in all objects of growth the following stages embody the preceding ones in their entirety thus contemplation attention is contained in abstraction both attention and contemplation are embodied and he who has reached the last stage brings into play in the act of contemplation all the four stages he who has perfected himself in concentration is able at any moment to bring his thoughts to a point upon any matter and to search into it with the strong light of an active comprehension he can both take a thing up and lay it down with equal deliberation he has learned how to use his thinking faculties to fixed purposes and guide them towards definite ends he is an intelligent doer of things and not a weak wanderer amid chaotic thought decision energy alertness as well as deliberation judgment and gravity accompany the habit of concentration and that vigorous mental training which its cultivation involves leads through an ever-increasing usefulness and success in worldly occupations towards that higher form of concentration called meditation in which the mind becomes divinely illumined and acquires the heavenly knowledge end of chapter seven recording by andrea fiore
Chapter 8 of The Mastery of Destiny. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. The Mastery of Destiny by James Allen. Chapter 8 Practice of Meditation. When aspiration is united to concentration, the result is meditation. When a man intensely desires to reach and realize a higher, purer, and more radiant life, than the merely worldly and pleasure-loving life, he engages in aspiration, and when he earnestly concentrates his thoughts upon the finding of that life, he practices meditation. Without intense aspiration, there can be no meditation. Lethargy and indifference are fatal to its practice. The more intense the nature of a man, the more readily will he find meditation and the more successfully will he practice it. A fiery nature will most rapidly scale the heights of truth in meditation when its aspirations have become sufficiently awakened. Concentration is necessary to worldly success. Meditation is necessary to spiritual success. Worldly skill and knowledge are acquired by concentration. Spiritual skill and knowledge are acquired by meditation. By concentration, a man can scale the highest heights of genius, but he cannot scale the heavenly heights of truth. To accomplish this, he must meditate. By concentration, a man may acquire the wonderful comprehension and vast power of a Caesar. By meditation, he may reach the divine wisdom and perfect peace of a Buddha. The perfection of concentration is power. The perfection of meditation is wisdom. By concentration, men acquire skill in the doing of things of life, in science, art, trade, etc. But by meditation, they acquire skill in life itself, in right living, enlightenment, wisdom, etc. Saints, sages, saviors, wise men and divine teachers, are the finished products of holy meditation. The four stages in concentration are brought into play in meditation, the difference between the two powers being one of direction and not of nature. Meditation is therefore spiritual concentration, the bringing of the mind to a focus in its search for the divine knowledge, the divine life, the intense dwelling in thought on truth. Thus a man aspires to know and realize, above all things else, the truth. He then gives attention to conduct, to life, to self-purification. Giving attention to these things, he passes into serious contemplation of the facts, problems, and mystery of life. Thus contemplating, he comes to love truth so fully and intensely as to become wholly absorbed in it. The mind is drawn away from its wanderings in a multitude of desires, and solving one by one the problems of life, realizes that profound union with truth, which is the state of abstraction, and thus absorbed in truth, there is that balance and poise of character, that divine action and repose, which is the abiding calm and peace of an emancipated and enlightened mind. Meditation is more difficult to practice than concentration, because it involves a much more severe self-discipline than that which obtains in concentration. A man can practice concentration without purifying his heart and life, whereas the process of purification is inseparable from meditation. The object of meditation is divine enlightenment, the attainment of truth and is therefore interwoven with practical purity and righteousness. Thus while, at first, the time spent in actual meditation is short, perhaps only half an hour in the early morning, the knowledge gained in that half hour of vivid aspiration and concentrated thought is embodied in practice during the whole day. In meditation, therefore, the entire life of a man is involved and as he advances in its practice, he becomes more and more fitted to perform the duties of life in the circumstances in which he may be placed, for he becomes stronger, holier, calmer, 
and wiser. The principle of meditation is twofold, namely, 1. Purification of the heart by repetitive thoughts on pure things. 2. Attainment of divine knowledge by embodying such purity in practical life. Man is a thought being, and his life and character are determined by the thoughts in which he habitually dwells. By practice, association, and habit, thoughts tend to repeat themselves with greater and greater ease and frequency, and so fix the character in a given direction by producing that automatic action which is called habit. By daily dwelling upon pure thoughts, the man of meditation forms the habit of pure and enlightened thinking, which leads to pure and enlightened actions and well-performed duties. By the ceaseless repetition of pure thoughts, he at last becomes one with those thoughts, and is a purified being, manifesting his attainment in pure actions, in a serene and wise life. The majority of men live in a series of conflicting desires, passions, emotions, and speculations, and there are restlessness, uncertainty, and sorrow. But when a man begins to train his mind in meditation, he gradually gains control over this inward conflict by bringing his thoughts to a focus upon a central principle. In this way, the old habits of impure and erroneous thought and action are broken up, and the new habits of pure and enlightened thought and action are formed. The man becomes more and more reconciled to truth, and there is increasing harmony and insight a growing perfection and peace. A powerful and lofty aspiration towards truth is always accompanied with a keen sense of the sorrow and brevity and mystery of life, and until this condition of mind is reached, meditation is impossible. Merely musing or whiling away the time in idle dreaming, habits to which the word meditation is frequently applied, are very far removed from meditation in the lofty spiritual sense which we attach to that condition. It is easy to mistake reverie for meditation. This is a fatal error which must be avoided by one striving to meditate. The two must not be confounded. Reverie is a loose dreaming into which a man falls. Meditation is a strong, purposeful thinking into which a man rises. Reverie is easy and pleasurable. Meditation is at first difficult and irksome. Reverie thrives in indolence and luxury. Meditation arises from strenuousness and discipline. Reverie is first alluring, then sensuous, and then sensual. Meditation is first forbidding, then profitable, and then peaceful. Reverie is dangerous. It undermines self-control. Meditation is protective. It establishes self-control. There are certain signs by which one can know whether he is engaging in reverie or meditation. The indications of reverie are 1. A desire to avoid exertion. 2. A desire to experience the pleasures of dreaming. 3 an increasing distaste for one's worldly duties. 4. A desire to shirk one's worldly responsibilities. 5. Fear of consequences. 6. A wish to get money with as little effort as possible. 7. Lack of self-control. The indications of meditation are 1 increase of both physical and mental energy. 2. A strenuous striving after wisdom. 3. A decrease of irksomeness in the performance of duty. 4. A fixed determination to faithfully fulfill all worldly responsibilities. 5. Freedom from fear. 6. Indifference to riches. 7. Possession of self-control. There are certain times, places, and conditions in and under which it is impossible to meditate, others wherein it is difficult to meditate, and others wherein meditation is rendered more accessible, and these, 
which should be known and carefully observed, are as follows. Times, places, and conditions in which meditation is impossible. 1. At or immediately after meals. 2. In places of pleasure. 3. In crowded places. 4. While walking rapidly. 5. While lying in bed in the morning. 6. While smoking. 7. While lying on a couch or bed for physical or mental relaxation. Times, places, and conditions in which meditation is difficult. 1. At night. 2. In a luxuriously furnished room. 3. While sitting on a soft, yielding seat. 4. While wearing gay clothing. 5. When in company. 6. When the body is weary. 7. If the body is given too much food. Times, places, and conditions in which it is best to meditate. 1. Very early in the morning. 2. Immediately before meals. 3. In solitude. 4. In the open air or in a plainly furnished room. 5. While sitting on a hard seat. 6. When the body is strong and vigorous. 7. When the body is modestly and plainly clothed. It will be seen by the foregoing instructions that ease, luxury, and indulgence, which induce reverie, render meditation difficult, and when strongly pronounced, make it impossible, while strenuousness, discipline, and self-denial, which dispel reverie, make meditation comparatively easy. The body, too, should be neither overfed nor starved, neither in rags nor flauntingly clothed. It should not be tired, but should be at its highest point of energy and strength, as the holding of the mind to a concentrated train of subtle and lofty thought requires a high degree of both physical and mental energy. Aspiration can often best be aroused, and the mind renewed in meditation, by the mental repetition of a lofty precept, a beautiful sentence or verse of poetry. Indeed, the mind that is ready for meditation will instinctively adopt this principle. Mere mechanical repetition is worthless, and even a hindrance. The words repeated must be so applicable to one's own condition that they are dwelt upon lovingly and with concentrated devotion. In this way, aspiration and concentration harmoniously combine to produce, without undue strain, the state of meditation. All the conditions above stated are of the utmost importance in the early stages of meditation, and should be carefully noted and duly observed by all who are striving to acquire the practice, and those who faithfully follow the instructions, and who strive and persevere, will not fail to gather in, in due season, the harvest of purity, wisdom, bliss, and peace and will surely eat of the sweet fruits of holy meditation. End of chapter 8 Recording by Andrea Fiore Chapter 9 of The Mastery of Destiny This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore The Mastery of Destiny by James Allen Chapter 9 The Power of Purpose Dispersion is weakness, Concentration is power. Destruction is a scattering, preservation a uniting process. Things are useful and thoughts are powerful in the measure that their parts are strongly and intelligently concentrated. Purpose is highly concentrated thought. All the mental energies are directed to the attainment of an object, and obstacles which intervene between the thinker and the object are, one after another, broken down and overcome. Purpose is the keystone in the temple of achievement. It binds and holds together in complete whole that which would otherwise lie scattered and useless. Empty whims, ephemeral fancies, vague desires, 
and half-hearted resolutions have no place in purpose. In the sustained determination to accomplish, there is an invincible power which swallows up all inferior considerations, and marches direct to victory. All successful men are men of purpose. They hold fast to an idea, a project, a plan, and will not let it go. They cherish it, brood upon it, tend and develop it, and when assailed by difficulties, they refuse to be beguiled into surrender. Indeed, the intensity of the purpose increases with the growing magnitude of the obstacles encountered. The men who have molded the destinies of humanity have been mighty men of purpose. Like the Roman laying his road, they have followed along a well-defined path, and have refused to swerve aside even when torture and death confronted them. The great leaders of the race are the mental road-makers, and mankind follows in the intellectual and spiritual paths which they have carved out and beaten. Great is the power of purpose. To know how great, let a man study it in the lives of those whose influence has shaped the ends of nations and directed the destinies of the world. In an Alexander, a Caesar, or a Napoleon, we see the power of purpose when it is directed in worldly and personal channels. In a Confucius, a Buddha, or a Christ, we perceive its vaster power when its course is along heavenly and impersonal paths. Purpose goes with intelligence. There are lesser and greater purposes according with degrees of intelligence. A great mind will always be great of purpose. A weak intelligence will be without purpose. A drifting mind argues a measure of undevelopment. What can resist an unshakable purpose? What can stand against it or turn it aside? Inert matter yields to a living force, and circumstance succumbs to the power of purpose. Truly the man of unlawful purpose will, in achieving his ends, destroy himself. But the man of good and lawful purpose cannot fail. It only needs that he daily renew the fire and energy of his fixed resolve, to consummate his object. The weak man, who grieves because he is misunderstood, will not greatly achieve. The vain man, who steps aside from his resolve in order to please others and gain their approbation, will not highly achieve. The double-minded man, who thinks to compromise his purpose, will fail. The man of fixed purpose who, whether misunderstandings and foul accusations, or flatteries and fair promises, rain upon him, does not yield a fraction of his resolve, is the man of excellence and achievement, of success, greatness, power. Hindrances stimulate the man of purpose, difficulties nerve him to renewed exertion, mistakes, losses, pains do not subdue him, and failures are steps in the ladder of success for he is ever conscious of the certainty of final achievement. All things at last yield to the silent, irresistible, all-conquering energy of purpose. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not whined nor cried aloud. Under the bludgering of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. End of chapter 9 Recording by Andrea Fiore